In our first MBT, A Day in the Park program, Thomas Campbell gave an introduction, answered questions, and gave his advice on how best to use Tom's Park. We have edited the content to be most useful to a general audience interested in using Tom's Park with its vast potential in developing your intuition in a fun and productive way. Now, here's Tom's introduction. So this is the very first of the day in a park. And what this was meant to be was to help those people who have gotten Tom's Park, they've tried out Tom's Park, and they have questions. They maybe have some issues. They're maybe not quite sure exactly what to do with it or how to work it, or maybe they have trouble with the intellect still jumping in or trouble with the imagination. This little session is to help work out those troubles, to help deal with the issues, to help explain how Tom's Park works and how you can get the most out of it. So that's really the point of the, of the gathering today. Everybody here has met the prerequisites, which means you have Tom Spark and you've actually tried it at least once. You have some experience with it. We really are going to be talking about that experience and how you can make the most of your Tom Spark experience. I know we have maybe a couple of people who have what's called aphantasia, which means they don't see things in their mind. Their mind's eye seems to always be shut. You know, so I know we have a few people like that have a hard time visualizing, and we can work with that and see, see what we can do for those types. I think there's a solution to that. Uh, we've had several such people have successes. So we'll approach it from several directions, and that's what we're all about. Now, Tom's Park... It's not a very long book. It's obviously not uh, a book that you read for the story. <laughs> There's no story there. It's strictly a, a process for you to help develop your intuitive side. And it doesn't matter whether your intuitive side is because you're a writer and you need better plots, or your intuitive side is because you want to do paranormal things, or your intuitive side is just because you'd like to be able to gather that intuitive information and make sure that it's accurate and correct. So whatever your interest is in developing that intuitive side, the Thomas Park should help you do that. It's also set up to help you do many, if not all of the paranormal things. So, you know, to remote view, to, out, to go out of body, to get data out of the databases, to do those kinds of things. The way it works is that I've created the structure that defines the park, defines the things in the park and how you can use them and gives you rules basically and suggestions for using them. And I lead you right up to the brink of using them. And then I let you be on your own. Okay, so you, I try to never tell you what to expect, what to do, you know, what you're going to get, what the results are going to be. But I lead you right up to that edge and then let you experience whatever you experience. And you will do much better with Tom's Park if you just let yourself experience. Instead of trying to have a particular experience, if you just let yourself experience whatever comes, be open to it. Don't judge it. Don't assess it. Don't say, is this real? Am I making this up or is the LCS giving me a data stream yet? Those sorts of things are all intellectual and they'll bump you right out of the intuitive mode. You want to stay in the intuitive mode. So have it in your mind that whatever happens, you're just going to go with it. You're going to experience it. And it doesn't matter where that data stream's coming from. It doesn't matter whether it's the LCS or you or some other UOC. You're just going to experience whatever happens. So if you can get that viewpoint that it's okay if it is 
quote, just your imagination. That's not a problem. You're going to experience it anyway. And if you can get there, then I think you'll find it's easier to end up with the things you actually want to do happening to you. It's better to let those things happen on their own rather than to pursue them. If you try to pursue a very particular subject, that often makes it more difficult to get the answers on that subject. The pursuit itself kind of chases away your quarry, if you will. You don't want to enter it in hot pursuit of a particular answer, at least not at first. At first, you just want experience, whatever it is, however it comes, wherever it comes from. And just enjoy that experience, go with that experience until that experience is easy, until you can co have experiences without, you know, struggling with it. Okay, then once you get to the point that you can just experience and you can have interesting and, and experiences that are engaging for you in detail and all the senses, now you can start being more specific certain things you'd like to accomplish, certain things you'd like to do. But the first step is just to have experience and have that experience flow naturally so that it goes from, let's say it's a conversation, it goes from you making up both sides of the conversation to the conversation just gets more organic and it just happens. It just flows and the conversation goes back and forth kind of by itself. So when you can get your imagination at that level of casual interaction, now you're ready to go on to step two, which is maybe get the information that you want or, you know, go out of body or do other sorts of things. So that's the very first step. And you get there just by repetition. You get there by repetition. So if the very first time you go to Tom's Park, you're stuck in your intellect, and you're making it up and your 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 conversations are you quite clearly making up both sides of the conversation you're doing the whole thing and you're aware of that that's okay that's just where you start if you start that way okay now that's probably where the very left brain logical process people will start but that's all right start there and find something engaging to do it has to be engaging, better if it's multisensory. Make it be multisensory. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, feel, all of it. And make it engaging, interesting, fun. And keep doing it and keep doing it. So where you're so familiar with that particular story that you really stop thinking about it. And the next time you do it, it just kind of rolls along on its own because you've done it 20 times already. You see, now you're getting to where you want to be. You're getting there and the story is beginning to roll on on its own. You're not really intentionally creating it in your imagination. You're just letting it flow. So even if that's where you start through iteration and keep doing it, you should eventually be able to get to a spot where it just begins to flow. And if that's because that's the hundredth time you've done it and you're so familiar with that story that that's why it's flowing, that's all right. That's a, that's a good place to be. It's flowing. You're letting the story go in its own way. Then you can change the story slightly, get a different story. Do the same thing with that. And when, when that starts to flow, get a different story. And what you're doing is while you're using your imagination, even if it's your intellect making it up, you are strengthening the muscles of your intuition. You're doing these light exercises, you are strengthening your intuitive muscles. You're getting to the point that the story goes on by itself, even if that's after much repetition. That's strengthening your intuitive muscles. And you just keep strengthening them and strengthening them until you are where you want to be. So it may, for some of you, be a slow process. It may take you months to get to where you want to be. That's okay. 
that's okay because this should be fun and interesting. That's the point. So it's not just that you're gazing at your belly button for 30 minutes a day. It should be something that's interesting and a little exciting and fun to do. Okay, meet interesting people. Now, meeting the people and having dialogue with them is a, another good thing to do because that really requires um, more of your letting go. So eventually, don't just do things, but do interactions with people, interactions with events, even if it's interactions with the hot springs or you know, with the, uh, uh, you know, the lily pond. Do interactions with things. Uh, go to the uh, travel agency and uh, you know, take, a, take a trip. Work with those trips. See how that works out. Again, doesn't matter where it comes from, just experience. The more you put time into just experiencing, the easier it will get, the stronger your intuitive muscles will grow, and eventually you'll have the mastery that you want. So that's the idea of Tom's part. Now, there's some of you, probably a large number of this group, as I recognize you, won't be a long time. There's an awful lot of you that'll that'll step up to it and on the very first try you'll be off someplace you'll be off and you'll be able to use the park like you know you were you were born to it it'll be very easy for you to get into something engaging get connected to it get lost in it and just let it take you wherever it goes so that will be the experience of of some of you and for people like that what you need to do is plan more about what it is you'd like to accomplish. What are the intuitive skills you'd like to work on? And then just kind of methodically work your way around experiencing all the things in Tom's part, using all the tools that are there, visiting all the various structures that I put there for you to interact with. And, and just in general, make it so it's not only easy for you to do certain things, but it's easier, it's easy for you to do whatever it is you want. Lots of different kinds of things. So don't just do the same thing that comes easy to you all the time, spread it out and keep doing different things, challenging things, things that are a little more difficult. Go to the Warner Recreation Center and get in a game of volleyball, just do different things until you've explored most of it. And that will just build up your confidence and your ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want, which will broaden your ability in your intuitive side, rather than, see, many of you will have a pretty well-developed intuitive side, but only in a very narrow slice of experience. You just do this thing, and you can do that one thing really well, but that's what you do. And when you get past or beyond that one thing, it gets harder. You're not quite so sure. That means you've gotten one muscle really well developed on the intuitive side, but you really want to develop all the muscles over there on the intuitive side. So then branch out. So whether you're a natural, somebody who's really finds this easy, or whether you're a beginner who finds this really, really hard, Tom's Park ought to be a tool that with iteration you can use to help yourself develop that intuition. And what we'd like to do is you get so familiar with that intuitive side that you can pop into it anytime you like and do the things you want to do with it. That's where we're going with it. It may not be tomorrow, but you can all get there if you work at it. Those of you that are going to struggle with your intellects, well, every time you go there and start developing a story and then get engaged in that story and re keep repeating that story until it flows well, all of that will help you develop that, in that intuitive side. So don't get frustrated with it and don't expect it to work instantly. But this is a tool just for developing intuitive muscle and then for helping you kind of guiding you into certain sorts of things like better health, like connecting with other people, like gathering data, like asking questions and getting help, 
connecting to the LCS, you know, all these things, you know, taking, taking trips, going off on out of bodies. All of these things have special tools there to help you do those things. But don't necessarily rush to those tools the first thing you do. So don't push the process too quickly. Wait until you're ready. And if you try something that doesn't work too well, well, you maybe you need to go back to basics a little bit more and keep just working on, on developing that intuitive side. Okay. So that's kind of Tom's part and how you use it, you know, how it was designed to be used. Now, another thing is that you can create things in Tom's part. You can take things away that I've put there if you want, but you can create new things. You're not stuck with just exactly what I put in it. If you would like something else that I haven't put in there, put it in there. You can create anything you like in your park. I had one person who, who wanted an airport so he could fly his plane there. Well, make an airport. That way you don't have to worry about driving your car, you can, you can just fly in, park your plane and go to Tom's Park. So anything that you, that you want, create that. If you would like to see that special waterfall that's up in the mountains that always has rainbow colors and butterflies flying around it, and you get there and there aren't any butterflies, put some butterflies there because they look really pretty there. You see? This is, this is your space to create in. And one of the fundamental purposes of Tom's Park is to take that creative side of yourself and make it more usable. You know, we all have creative sides, but typically we have to wait for inspiration, you know, to hit us. And when, when that inspiration hits us, wow, we're creative. But when that inspiration is gone, well, we're flat. Well, this will develop that intuitive side to the point that inspiration will always be there. And you'll get that download. You'll get that what you need to create more easily, more automatically. So it's not really just about doing paranormal things. It's, it's about being creative, being intuitive understanding things on a deeper and bigger level. That's what it's about. So it's, it's about developing that other half of you that's been neglected over the last 30 or 40 years. It's just been very haphazardly stumbling along perhaps, but it, you haven't really had a tool to consistently work at developing that intuitive side in a general way, not just in a very specific instance, but in a general way. And whether that's going to help you be creative in your work or however you want to apply this, then it's, it's a good tool for anyone who needs to use that intuition for creativity, for ideas. You're working on state-of-the-art concepts and ideas, and you're trying to solve problems, even if it's technical problems. Intuition is a great place to solve things because the possibilities are more easily reachable there. Your intellect tries to sit down and look at all the possibilities, and it's very limited. It's limited to just what it knows in its intellect. Your intuition can look at the array of possibilities, and it's a much broader set of possibilities. You can find solutions there. So whether you're solving a hard math problem <laughs> or you know, want to go out of body, it doesn't matter. That intuitive side is very useful for the rest of your life. That intuitive side is how you develop and control your, your empathy and your connection to other people to help you understand them, what they're feeling, what they're thinking. What does the world you know, look like through their eyes? Can you appreciate where they're coming from? Can you feel their emotions? That's all on the intuitive side help you immensely with relationships. So it's not just the Tom's part for learning how to go out of body or that sort of thing. It's, just a, it's a very general tool for developing your intuition and your intuitive side. So that's kind of
kind of the the one over on on Tom's part, you know, what it's supposed to do and how you're supposed to use it, which is iteratively. It's not a one time thing. It's not let's jump in and then go go out of body. Well, if you're ready for that, that'll work. If you're not yet ready for that, you've got some work to do first to, before you build up those intuitive muscles to the point that you can do that. But don't give up and don't try to drive it with your intellect. The intuitive side has to just happen on its own. There's no way you can reach out and grab it and make it your own. You have to just let it develop in its own way at its own time. All you can do is keep exercising those intuitive muscles and then let them take you wherever they take you. And try to find the, the, the lesson, the, the learning point, wherever they take you, whatever the experience is. If it's not what you intended, don't just throw it away. Say, well, what could I learn from that? And if you have that attitude and you just let it take you wherever it does, however long it takes you to get there, then you will get there more quickly than if you try to push on it and make it take you there now. That doesn't usually work very well. That's your intellect trying to be in control and make things happen the way it wants. So this is something, the intellectual side isn't something that you whip into shape. <laughs> it's something you experience. And through that experience, you learn. Okay. Now, some of the experiences you'll have, you won't really know what to make of them. You won't know whether that was all your imagination or not. That's okay. That's the way it is in the beginning. The more experience you have, the more opportunity you will have to actually get information and have experiences that you know were not in your head. You couldn't have made them up even if you'd tried. They just were things strange to your own way of thinking. And then you'll begin to gain confidence that indeed you are getting a data stream that's outside of yourself. Indeed, you are communicating with another consciousness. But that takes time. In the beginning, just don't have any worry at all where it's coming from. Just experience, enjoy, and have fun. Now, the more intense, the more connected your experience is, the more you embrace that experience, the better it will be. If it's just an, an experience of standing in a corner in a gray room, and that's all you're doing, then you're not going to learn much from that. It has to be an engaging, a vibrant, uh, an experience. And like I say, the more, sense, the more senses that you use, the better. So taste, stop and taste and smell, as well as feel what you're doing. Okay? And just a little bit, little steps at a time. Repeat, repeat, repeat until you're so comfortable with it. It's easy to embrace it. Keep it interesting. Don't, if you get bored with a particular thing, change it. Make it different. The more engaged you get in it, the more you're drawn to it, the more successful you're going to be with it. So don't just pick a simple experience of doing one thing and and get stuck there. Make it varied. Getting your intuitive muscles strengthened in a very general way is not necessarily going to be trivial, easy, or quick. But it's something you can do if you, you know, if you stay with it. You should see results in, in a couple of months. You know, if you stay with it, if it's like a daily thing that you do in a couple of months, you ought to see difference. Your stories ought to flow better. You ought to feel, you know, more connected to it. it, it there should be some, some change there. If not, then you need to reassess what you're doing and do it differently. Don't just keep pouring good after bad. If you find a process that doesn't work, change it up. All of these kind of explorations should be approached as you, the scientist, you, the experimenter, 
and you're experimenting and then you see what happens. And if it doesn't work, do something else. Try another approach and just keep doing that. It's a trial and error kind of situation. Every one of you is different. Every one of you, the way you approach it, the things you get, the path you take, they're all going to be different. So I can't tell you just what path you should take. That, that's very much a function of you and how your consciousness, how your mind works, what your beliefs are, what your fears are. All of those things will make a big difference. So just try, see what happens, learn from it. If it works, do, do it more. If it really works and really works, well, you still need to do things differently to exercise more of those muscles and just keep working at it. It's a long, you know, this should be something that you, I mean, how many years have you been exercising your intellect, right? Since kindergarten, right? And you were memorizing the alphabet, you know, you've been, you've been working on that intellect for years and years and years and years, and you're probably still working on it, still learning things, learning new things understanding things better with that intellect. Well, now you have to start putting that same kind of energy into getting your intuitive side going. The following nuggets are Tom's answers, advice, and observations to questions from the participants. We hope you will find them useful. If the first trip to the park was very easy, how do I get back just as easily? You're good at things when you're a beginner because you don't fear failure. You don't really have any expectations. You don't have any needs. You just let's try it and see what happens. You have a very casual attitude toward it the first time. And then after success, you say, oh, okay, that's great. Now I can, I can do a whole lot better. And now it just doesn't work. And that's because now you're trying. And before you were very casual. So... That's why it works that way. Now, what can you do about it? You can use the binaural beats with it. You can get your binaural beats from one of the classes you've had, or you can just get them from Keith. And you can pick a binaural beat that you like and play that while you, you do the part. That should help you get into a good meditation space first. Other than that, stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. Stop trying to do it by thinking about it. The thinking about it is what's getting in the way. You have to just do it without thinking about it. And I know when you're left brain, that's like, you know, the sound of one hand clapping, right? That that's just doesn't compute. But you, you have to not think your way there. It's not, well, okay, now what am I going to do? Okay, well, I'll try this and then I'll try that. Well, that's your intellect trying to solve the problem, and the intellect is the problem. So I would say, try your binaural beats with it to help you get into a good meditation state and hold that meditation state. Don't worry about the background. In as much as you say, oh, let's see, I got to get it dark and it needs to be quiet. Oh, no, there's a sound. Oh, I can hear the traffic outside. Oh, what a nuisance. As much as you worry about the background, the background will be a problem. Let the background be whatever it is, whether it's light or dark or noisy or quiet, just let it be and say, that's all right. I can, I can imagine things in any background. And if that still gives you trouble, I'd say start practicing just with some imagination. Just imagine things. Imagine standing in the sand on a beach. Okay. And if you've ever been to a beach, you ought to have that memory. Bring that memory up of standing in sand, wiggling your toes in the sand, you know, hearing the surf come in. That's something that's, that your memory should be able to bring up for you. Then just do that. And you'll see that you can do that whether there's traffic outside or not. It doesn't matter. You see? And if you can do that, well, then you can be standing in the sand in Tom's Park. And you can feel the sand in your toes just the same. So work with it like that. Try to come up on it a piece at a time. Don't try so hard. Just let it happen. Don't worry about, oh, am I not in the right state? Thoughts just keep coming. This isn't working for me. 
oh no, now what am I going to do? Well, all right, let me try this and let me try that. And if you get into that, that working at it state, then that prevents it from happening. So that's why it worked for you the first time, because you didn't start with that beginner's luck. You just, well, let's, let's see what happens. And bingo, it happened. So it's a matter of relaxing, letting go, and just letting it flow on its own. And if your intellect just refuses to, to let you alone like that, then start with the sand and the beach. Start with other memories, other things you remember. What, what about some of the vacations you went on with your family? Remember them. If you've been any place interesting in the last year or two, remember it. Be there and in as much detail as you can. Think about it and smell it, taste it, walk the streets, do whatever, and just practice being in your imagination, being in your memory. And then you just transfer that over to Tom's Park, the sand in Tom's Park, the walkways in Tom's Park, whatever else. It's just remember being in Tom's Park. You have some memories from the first time you were there. Remember those. So that's how I'd work on it. Aphantasia, that's the inability to see visuals. The question is, are there solutions and success possible with the other senses? Well, you can practice with things that you have out of your memory, things mm -hmm. that you're familiar with. Maybe your family every year went to a certain place for vacation or something. Well, you're pretty familiar with that place, even if that was 30 years ago. Well, go there, you know, re go back to those places, but don't just go there like you're looking at a map. Go there and smell it. Go get a pizza there and eat it. You know, feel the, the grass or the sand or whatever's there. Or go swimming. Get involved in it in as much sensory data as you can. And besides that, feel the feel it in the sense, not just with through touch, but feel the, the feelings of it, the emotions of it. How did you feel when you were there? You know, what were what did it feel like? Was it happy or sad or open or scary or what was it? So those are exercises you can do with st strong memories that you have. And that is just using your imagination except you're using it with something that you know, you have memory to back it up. You have a lot of memory. But then you can go to Tom's Park and you can use that same memory when you were at the beach to be at the beach at Tom's Park. But if you've done it with the things that you're familiar with, it's going to be easier to do it with things you're not familiar with. Then you'll just transfer it over to what you're not familiar with. So I'd start with that. Go back into your memories and until you can be really good at remembering exactly how things tasted and felt and looked and so on. And I think if you just practice that a while, you'll find that when you get to Tom's Park, it'll be easy because it's the same thing. You won't be doing anything any differently. I've given enough description and detail on the map with Tom's Park that it shouldn't be hard to fill in the details. The water on your feet at Tom's Park is no different than the water on your feet at Myrtle Beach, you know, where your family was, you know, it's just, it's the same sort of thing. It's just the repetition. Keep working with that and until it becomes easier. And again, don't try. Or maybe I should say, try really hard not to try. If I see certain things in Tom's Park, I did not expect. Is that a data stream given to me? If things that happen that you don't expect, then just consider you're getting a data stream. Work with it. You know, say hello, get to know them, uh, get to know the staff that's there, get to know the other people that are there, and just see where it leads. As you get more and more comfortable with it, it's like anything. Even if you physically went to a park, you would be less comfortable with it than if you'd been to that same park 50 times. It's the same thing. The more you go there, the more comfortable you'll get and the more easy it will be to talk to people and have interactions, make friends. Would it be better to parallel process Thomas Park than daydream? 
I would think it's probably a better use of your time to parallel process Tom's part. Typically, people's daydreams tend to wander and are not as productive, whereas Tom's part's kind of constructed to keep you focused on things that will help you develop that intuitive side more. So it's just a little more structured space that you'll probably get more value out of than if you just do a routine, just letting your mind wander sort of thing. So sure, little bits like that, you could pop in for five, 10 minutes, or even if just a few minutes at a time. Is tapping into memories to reach the park a good idea? You can start in your car, just like, just like uh, uh, Michael said, he parachutes in. You can drive in if you like. So you're driving your car along the beach, and then you can just take a sharp right turn and drive through the woods and uh, there's a parking lot, go park your car and, you know, walk into the park. So let whatever's easy for you to do, use it. And then just let that be a, a transition, a segue into the park. Now, again, you can make things in your own mind at the park. If your park being on a lake just doesn't suit you very well because you grew up on a beach, make your park border on the ocean. So your park has surf. So that's perfectly fine. You can adjust your park to, to be how it suits you best. But all the other attributes that are in the park are still there. You know, you still have the athletic center, you still have the, the staff, you still have the dining rooms, you still have all of that stuff. But if a beach suits you better, then put it on the coast instead of on a lake. Use what you have that you feel comfortable with and work that right into you know your experience and work that right into the into the park don't make the park a, a really different thing make it something that's comfortable for you what do you do if images move too fast i think it would be best if you just let your mind run loose you know let yourself be free do whatever you do. And if it changes every five seconds, you're something else doing something else. Let that happen. Don't worry about it. What happens is eventually you'll get tired of that. It, it, it won't have much purpose and you will, you will let it go. And, but you will have experience doing 50 different things. And then you'll go back maybe to one or two of those things that you really like best. Maybe the flying like the bird. Uh, you may find some other birds that are very interesting to, to talk to. Um, you know, let it develop slowly. But I think right now, you're right. It's like you're seven years old and you just walked into Six Flags. You know, wow, what do I do? You know, let's run and do this and run and do that. And, and just do that. Let it be free for a while until you get tired of it. And when you're tired of it, it'll start to settle down. And when it settles down, you you do a few things, and eventually you'll get to the point that you'll be right back where you were before. You go to the park in order to, you know, go to the fear clinic and talk, talk to your, you know, talk to your person. Or you, you'll have very specific things you'll want to do, or you'll want to go into the hexagon room and do this or that. So it will change with time. But I'd say let it, let, let yourself play until you get tired of playing experience everything you can experience let your imagination just run through all the possibilities the more the better and that that range of possibilities will actually open you up to things that you would never have thought of that uh, you might find very profitable so play play first i've met good friends and creatures in tom's park how do i find them again Bring them up just in your mind. Think of that individual, that horse that was not a horse. Uh, remember the conversation and pick right back up on that conversation again. And that being will appear. That will bring them to you or you to them. And the connection will just be made. So just start the conversation and it will, it will happen. And the one good thing about Tom's Park, you'll never run into the problem is that thing doesn't live here anymore. Anything that's there is always there and always available for you whenever you're ready. 
Should we keep repeating the future probabilities exercises in the hexagon room? It would be better to go in there and I think it's the red button that exits you. So you want to, I think hit the hit the green button when you're when you're ready. And then you put your you put your intent into that modifying that probability. And your intent, because you're plugged directly in to the technology that computes those probabilities, you can have a lot of effect on changing those probabilities. So that's, you stay there, keep that focus going, just like you would be if you were meditating and trying to put an intent to modify future probability. You might put five minutes or 10 minutes in it while you're, while you're doing it. Well, you do the same thing there while you have your headpiece on and you're all connected up. You have you would put that intention in there, put as much energy into that intention as you can until you feel like you've done everything that you could do. You know, you, you push, you know, you do that until you feel like you're done. Yes, that would be the way you could use it. Then you can hit the red button and exit. Um, now you can come back, but you probably don't need to come back for I don't know, maybe later in the day, probably wouldn't need to do that more than two or three times in a day to optimize the effect that you're having. But each time, maybe five or 10 or 15 minutes, whatever you feel, you know, you'll know when you feel like you're done, you know, you've given it all you got, that's your intent. And you might as well just stop and do something else. So yeah, that's how you would use it very much like you would in a meditation. Depends on what kind of probabilities you're trying to change. Let's say you're trying to change somebody's health. Yes, you'll do about your as much as you're going to do in a couple of weeks because you're you're going for a very specific result. If next month you're going to have an event, you know, outside, your your daughter's getting married in an outside wedding next month, and you don't want it to be rainy. Well, you can work on that all month long, but you wouldn't work on it for hours, you know, every day, all month long. That's probably way too much, but you would, you would work on it maybe once a week, you know, for the, the month or the two months that, that you have to work on it. So it just depends on, on what you're, on what it is that you're, you're doing. Things that are likely to change fast, like the weather you'd need to put more effort into it close, closer to it, but you could still put some effort into it further out just to make sure that all the patterns that were necessary, you know, with the low pressures and this and that and humidity and all that stuff was kind of working towards your end, the way you'd want it to be. And then you'd hit it harder in the last, you know, three or four or five days before the event. Whereas with healing, if you start the body to healing and the body is in that process of becoming healthier, well, you've done it. You can keep pushing at it, but you're probably not going to do much more to it than what you've already done. I tend to forget the experiences in the park. Any advice? You can go back and continue and pick up where you left off as much as you like. There's no, there's no limit. You're not only allowed a certain number of visits you know, per week. You can, you can go back as often as you want to. And one of the things that'll help your memory is if you, when you particularly get information that you say, oh, this is really important. I don't want to forget this. Repeat it in your own mind four or five times. You know, I really don't want to forget this. This is the, 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 the and this is the solution to my problem. I really need to turn right here instead of left and just repeat it. And then as you go through it, and maybe 10 or 20 minutes later, and you're some other place at a park, you can go back. Oh, okay, back when I was in the library, this is something important I want to remember. I really want to go right there and not left, you know? And you keep reinforcing it, reinforcing it as you can. I think you'll find that that'll help a whole lot. By the time you get done, you'll, you'll say, now, what was that? And bingo, it'll come right back because you've reinforced it, so... That was a trick I had to do when I was working out at Monroe's laboratory. I would sometimes forget things too. And things that I knew were important. And I'd come back and say, wow, I had a really great 
epiphany and understanding. And now I don't know what it is. And I'd be very you know, upset that I had something that I needed so much to understand. And it just slipped away from me that I started this repetition while I was there. So just every, every so often, I just interrupt myself and say, oh, let me do another repetition of that because I don't want to forget it. And that solved the problem. So you can, you can try that, but you can always go back and pick up where you left off. The question is on the intellect taking charge. Your intellect is asserting itself and wants to get in control. The intellect wants to control the process because how can it make sure that it works out well if it doesn't control it? You see, so you probably need to let both of those methods go and just try something else. Just go there some other way. Say, all right, that's my okay, intellect. You can you can have those two. I'm going to go to Tom's Park by another route, and I'm not even going to tell you that I'm going. <laughs> you know, I'm going to leave you home in the closet. You know, so lock your intellect in the closet before you start, and then uh, go ahead and, and go in by a different way, and see if that doesn't work. And you can try other metaphors besides locking it in a closet. <laughs> however, you want to to do those, but eventually you'll find some metaphors that'll work well for you. And if you find ways that used to work, but don't work so well anymore, again, that's a, that's a fear. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a performance anxiety problem. Well, this worked really good, but what if it doesn't work? What if it stops working? Then what am I going to do? See, that's kind of a fear. And then, of course, that's exactly what happens. So just pick another way. Pick another way and, and uh, put your... Sometimes uh, people take that intellect and they lock it in a trunk. You know, they, they get it and they fold it up nice and neatly. They put it in a trunk, close the door, lock it. So uh, you can try things like that and see if you can't get it to behave. But it's, it's your own fear that you're struggling with. But you need to, to use metaphors to work with that struggle. If you just keep trying to do the same thing, usually it just gets harder and harder. You know, it gets worse and worse. Pretty soon you and your intellect are in a fight and that just doesn't seem to resolve. So you just need to let alone and say, okay, intellect, you can have those two paths. I won't use those anymore. I'm going to do something else. And by the way, would you step into this closet just for a minute? <laughs> Slam the door, lock it, put down the latch, just things like that. I need advice on getting clear sensory data challenges. The clear sensory data doesn't really matter so much. That will come more as it becomes useful to you. Right now, the information that you get is flowing and it doesn't require sensory data. So you're still in Tom's part. You're still using the, the tools. It's still working. Just let it be the way it is. If you get a sense of, oh, I'd like more information, then you'll need to kind of stop and specifically intend to see more detail, to hear more detail, to feel things, you know, and for that, rather than a conversation, you'd probably better be at the beach or in the water or, you know, walking on a trail or doing something more physical where there's more sense, sensory input than there is in a conversation. So I would just work with what you have that's working. And if you feel you'd like more sensory data, then go to a place that's full of sensory data. Go down to Uncle Tom's Grill and, and get yourself an ice cream cone and just taste it. So do things like that. And then you can go back up to the room and do some mental stuff. And if at that point, the, the, the visuals kind of fade, that's eh, all right. You don't need visuals there. You're getting, you're getting an information transfer. You don't have to see or smell or taste things there. If you'd like to do it, start focusing on more and more detail, more and more sensory information, and then that'll start to come, and then it'll all blossom, and it'll be really great, and then uh, it probably won't. It'll stop. So it's it's not like you're going to always see, you know, 4K visuals everywhere you go. 
you'll see them when you need them and when you want them. But if you don't need them or want them, actually, that's just extra data. It's more efficient just to get what you need to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Where is the best place in the park to help heal someone? Now, wherever healing advice is offered, always check with your medical professional first. One would be there's a room off the hexagon room that is there particularly for modifying future probability. That would be a really good place to go. The second place to go would be into the lily pad garden because that there's a really powerful vortex there and that amplifies your intent to modify future probability. That would be a good place to go. And thirdly, you could go to the hot springs and have your friend, the person that you want to heal, have them there. So in your imagination, they are there too. And you can take them and give them the instructions on how they need to get in and how they need to relax and let everything go and then slip out and leave all the, the heavy stuff behind. And you can let them do that a couple of times, different times, and that will work. So all three of those things would be ways that you could heal. Can daydreams lead you to Tom's Park? That does happen because now that imagination of yours, that intuitive side has gotten much stronger and you've let it be rather than trying to constrain it and analyze it and slice it and dice it. You've just let it alone to be whatever it is. And now it starts to pop up now and again, and you should notice it and say, well, okay, there it is. And don't let it really disturb you, but notice that it's there. And I think that the next step after that is you're going to find ways to use it. When that little things pop up, you're going to, you're going to get information. You're going to see things that are going to help you in your day-to-day -day PMR world. And pretty soon that's going to become a part of you that you live in the PMR world and in the Tom's Park world in the intuitive space all the time. There's parts of you that are in both spaces and you stay that way, you know, so you'll be talking to somebody and, and they'll be telling you a, a, a sad story of some sort. And then you'll kind of flip into an intuitive space and you see all the stuff leading up to that sad story and the feelings and, you know, you get a whole much richer view of it just instantly because you're there. And so right now those little bubbles are just popping here and there, just notice them. And uh, I think you'll find that as time goes on, they'll become useful. And then pretty soon they'll become a part of your life. I find it difficult to talk with a person at Tom's Park. Do you have a suggestion? I would suggest instead of starting a conversation with the person, you should talk to some of the animals. I just heard that there's a very talkative raccoon that is at the small animal park. There's lots of squirrels and chipmunks and other things that would just love to chat with you. I mean, they love talking. Anybody will sit down and listen, you know, they'll, they'll talk and they're good conversationalists. If you go ride a horse and get on the horse and, and trot around, all the horses are, uh, are pretty talkative. And if you go up into the orchards, uh, back, toward the mountains, you'll find lots of animals that are a little on the wild side, but also they are very keen to talk with people. They, for them, that's fun. They like talking to people. So go find some of these non-human entities. They all are conscious. They are conscious. They're all very aware. And, and some of them are very intelligent, very deep in their understanding of things, particularly the horses. They they, I don't know where they get all their information, but they seem to really know a whole lot. So start there with the critters because they're not going to be as intimidating to you as far as the conversation goes. This tool, Tom's Park, has put new life in my meditation. How can I let go of the fear that this reality 
seems less significant now. It is all connected, of course, because it's all, what do we call it, artifacts of consciousness. You know, it's all part of your consciousness, your awareness, and the things that consciousness can do. So your consciousness can reach out and interact and connect in multiple reality frames. You know, you're a multidimensional consciousness. So it shouldn't be too surprising that you can, that you find connections between the various things that you're doing with your consciousness, which isn't all just is your consciousness. So I'd say work with that a little bit. If the two tend to want to interact, you, I, I would let them. I don't know that that should be too scary a thing. But you always have to be confident that where you're going with it is okay. So if you get into a situation where you feel like, mm, I'm not so sure about this, that this is you know, going to be productive, then don't go there. There's lots of paths that you can take. Some of them are more productive than others. So if you start down a path and it appears to you that maybe it's not going to be very productive, for whatever reason, maybe because you're not ready yet, maybe because it's just fundamentally an unproductive path, then all paths don't have to be equally productive. So when you run into things that are, you think not as productive or things that eh, you don't quite feel ready yet, then don't go there. When you are ready, if it, that's important, it'll come back up again and you'll be nudged to go there. But if you're not, then just leave it alone. It either isn't important to you or you're not ready for it yet or it's superfluous. So in other words, let things happen on their own until you're not too sure that you like the result. And if that's the case, then back up and go elsewhere. But you always have the choice, your consciousness, you have free will, the choice is always yours. You don't have to go down any rabbit hole just because you see a rabbit go down it. You don't have to run down after it like Alice. You can always say, eh, not that hole, not now. And go elsewhere. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not like that's a problem. That's fine. You are a consciousness. You make your best choices. You do the things you think are most profitable and uh, do them slowly Take one step at a time. Don't rush into things necessarily because you tend to be a very careful person. So just do things slowly. Explore. See how that feels. If it feels good, explore a little more and keep going. If it doesn't feel good, do something else. Don't push yourself into things you're uncomfortable with. Often when you're doing an out-of-body, you don't get things real clearly. Sometimes you do. It depends on the out-of-body and what the purpose of the out-of-body is. But let's say you're having a conversation, typically in an out-of-body, when you're interacting with another being, that your background, your surroundings, your environment is all just grayed out. There's nothing there. It's just you and the other being. And if you kind of look around, you realize that there, there, is, no, there is no environment. Well, that's because it's unnecessary. No environment is necessary for your communication to take place. So no environment is rendered. So it could be that in the reality where you have less detail, you don't need any more detail than what you're getting. And if things change to where you do need more detail, you'll get it. So just because it's, it's not like you think maybe it should be, don't, you know, that's not necessarily a good way to look at it. It is what it is learn from it and deal with it however it is. And if it needs to be different for your growth, it will be. If you're in Tom's Park and you want more detail, then go do things that have a lot of sense data to them, things that you can smell and taste and touch. And then you'll find lots of sense data will get real sharp. But maybe if you're eating an ice cream cone, it'll almost all be taste. And it'll all be taste, but you won't really notice where you are or that there are trees or beaches or anything else. It'll just kind of fade away and it'll be nothing but taste. And then when you're done with that ice cream cone, maybe your surroundings will come back. 
And if you want to go examine the bark on the tree, you may find that it's in excruciating detail. You can see tiniest little, little things there. But everything else except that, that tree and that piece of that tree is gone. It's not in your environment anymore. So a lot of our, our focus on things tends to be where do we put our attention? And where we don't have attention, things tend to gray out. And that happens in this reality, in this PMR reality too. The things we don't pay attention to just kind of gray out. We, we don't see them. So maybe also that. So don't find something wrong where there isn't anything wrong. Or don't find anything, don't find things you need to change when the way they are is okay. Can you go to Tom's Park after you die? Sure, you could. It's not a problem at all. It is a virtual reality. And it's a virtual reality in which, you know, you and the, a larger conscious system participate. So there'd be no problem at all going to Tom's Park after you die. What about binaural beats in Tom's Park? Well, the binaural beats that you got were the binaural beats that, that uh, I made for the immersive program, which is a program in, in teaching people how to experience the, the paranormal and what the paranormal is and how it works, that sort of thing. And I put in a large range of them because just as you say, it's very personal. Some people like certain ones and just don't like others. So I put a very wide set of binaural beats there that uh, I think most everybody could find at least one or two or three that, that work pretty well for them. So use the ones that work best for you and, and don't use the others until you feel so comfortable with the ones that are working good for you. Then it would be good to go back and try those others again, because which ones work best for you have mostly to do with you. And you change as you learn and you grow, you change, particularly as you develop your intuitive skills, you'll change. And even, even you at different times during the same day will change what kind of binaural beats work best for you. So every once in a while, you should go back and kind of go through them again just to see what, what happens, whether you've changed any of your opinions about them. But if in Tom's Park, of course, you're, you're, you will, when you start your, your imaginary story rolling, you will forget about your sense data. So that's why I, I don't say, well, first thing you do is get in a good meditation state, because a good meditation state, you let go of your sense data. You no longer hear, see, smell, you know, touch things. You're, you're in a, a completely mental world. The physical world kind of drops away. Well, this will automatically happen. You don't really have to meditate to get in Tom's Park because just by spinning an imaginary tail, you drop your sense data. So using your imagination is just another form of meditation. It helps you get into a good meditation state. Now, for those people who have a hard time keeping their mind focused on what they're doing and who have a hard time with coming up with an interesting story in their imagination, then the binaural beats may help them because what the binaural beat does is it tends to encourage your, your theta state. That's, the, that's basically around a four hertz vibration in your EEG. If you had all those electrodes pasted on your head, like you get when you go to the doctor sometime and, and they have, a, they get a little alert curve and a bunch of wavy lines out. That's a, that's an EEG. And that measures the, the brainwave uh, activity that you have. And it comes out in lots of different frequencies and each frequency can have different amplitudes. And when you meditate, those frequencies tend to migrate toward four hertz. In other words, more and more of the energy in your brainwave starts to move toward the four hertz. So the four hertz uh, frequency has a real big peak because that's where most of your energy is and your others have much smaller peaks. So 
they realize that when they just take people who meditate a lot and put EEG and see what a meditating mind, how a meditating mind looks different compared to an awake mind. And that's pretty much what they found. Now, that's kind of a, a simplistic view, but the binaural beats tend to do that same thing. They encourage you, they, they entrain your brainwaves to the four hertz. At least that's what mine do that you have. So it just is an aid to help you not only get into, but stay in a meditation state. So my advice is to use them if they help you. If it doesn't matter, then don't use them. Only use them if they work. Find the ones that work, and every once in a while, test the others. When you're not in a good state of mind, is it more difficult to reach Tom's Park? When you're not in a good state of mind, you're in a, a situation where your confidence is very low, where you're not all that pleased with yourself and who you are and, and you know where you are and what you're doing. And if that's the case, then that tends to create, you know, any fear tends to create more fears. Fears tend to multiply very, very quickly. So if you're, if you're in a state of, of uh, kind of a funk about yourself, then that definitely could be where your problem is. Conversation experiences in the park sometimes come and go. How do we keep the game moving? If it's suddenly kind of a barrier comes down and like you were having a conversation and now it just stops, then that's probably your intellect has probably uh, jumped in and is doing a little analysis of this conversation. Oh, is that me talking to myself? Or would I say those things? You know, and it starts doing its analysis. And of course, that'll shut it off. So it could be that going on. Uh, that that uh, logical process mind sometimes is very difficult to get it to stay on the sidelines. It wants to get in there and fix things and analyze things and judge things and get in control. It really wants to do that and is not too happy with just you just experiencing and letting whatever happens happens and have the experience. So that would be something. It could be um, that it's just a matter that you haven't really gotten real secure in the idea that the that the imagination now is, is running itself. You're no longer playing both parts of that conversation. And if you're not real confident with that, then that will jump, that will jump in and out. So this the thing with Tom's part is that you can be a hundred percent in your imagination, or you can be a hundred percent in a data stream from outside you and anywhere in between. So you know it could be 1090, you know, 2080, it could be any combination, and it can go back and forth. That's very fluid. So you can be a hundred percent in a data stream outside of you and then only 90% and then 80% and then 90% again and then 100% and then back to 30% in the beginning when you're just learning and just getting used to it that that mixture of you and and outside of you will tend to be pretty fluid it will come and go as your confidence builds and you get into it oh well then that confidence builds and you're very close to 100% and then when you're not quite so sure and you're thinking about it and, oh, that person just said that, gee, that's kind of odd. I probably wouldn't have said that, you know, and you start analyzing it, eh, then you slip from 100% down to maybe 50%. So that's okay. It's just part of getting used to it. You have to be in the park enough times that you develop confidence in what it is you're, you're doing. And for somebody who's very left brain, that's going to be more times, you know, it may be 20, 30, 40 trips to the park before you get to the point where you feel confident about what you're doing. But take as many, you know, use as many as you as you need. There's no rush. It's a it's a thing that you can just kind of work on in the background and, and uh, let it work out. However, it does, but I think you'll find that over time, it gets easier and easier, and your confidence grows in what it is you're doing. And those 
kind of odd drops in conversation will begin to become less and less. Is it possible to take our younger selves into the park with memories of, say, our grandfather? I think it's entirely not only possible, but a good idea to uh, take your, your uh, grandfather into Tom's Park, you know, meet him there and, and uh, have a conversation with them. And you can do that as a little girl or as an adult. You can do it either way. You've just only done it so far as a, as a child because that's how you see the relationship. That's the way it was. But you can do that also as an adult. You can talk with him and you can bring him in at almost any age. He can be 25 years old. You can talk to him at that age. So yes, bringing, other, bringing your friends or family into the park is just imagining them there and then getting in, involved with them there to the point that, again, you're not the one supplying the data stream. The data stream just takes on a, a life of its own. So surely you can, uh, if you can bring him there and you're a child, you can then just not be a child. You can decide what age that you'd like to be in order to have the conversation that you want to have, and it will be that way. Do you think the park can be carried over into the next life? You can always create space in mind space. You can always create a space in, inside of mind that has in it what you wish. And that's always available to you. It's just whether or not you are grown up enough to know that you can do that and do it. So in your next lifetime, if you get to the point that you realize you can do that, then yes, you could. And since that, let's say, would if you're coming back here, then that would be in the future of here, and Tom Spark ought to be around. So in, and unless it's uh, no longer in print, it uh, should still be around. And if it catches your attention, and indeed, you could, but you'd have to redefine it. You're not going to bring along with you all the, oh, here's the lily pond, and there's the, you know, the recreation center, and all that's not going to come with you. You're going to have to pick that back up again. But uh, if it is with you when you first transition, you can spend some time there. You know, if you, re if you remember those details, you could spend some time there then. Your consciousness, as consciousness, you can create virtual realities. The only thing that you can't do that the larger system can do is you can't send other people data streams and have them appear in your virtual reality. You know, you have to bring them into your virtual reality through your own imagination, then let the system pick up the data stream. But other than that, we're consciousness and we have pretty much all the attributes that the larger conscious system has. So you can create virtual reality on your own. Uh, the only advantage to Tom's Park versus the one that you create on your own is that I have a bunch of things to do there that are already outlined that you don't have to make up or figure out. And I've got some leads to, to do most of the things you'd probably like to do. So that's already, the structure's already there to kind of take you to a successful connection. As soon as you get to the point that you stop controlling it and you let go, the system will come in and start feeding you a data stream. And the reason it'll do that is that the data stream it feeds you will be something that will help you grow. In other words, it'll be, it'll be a tool of the system to help you see bigger pictures and help you understand things. A Fantasia advice to experience Tom's Park. Can we populate Tom's Park with memories? Absolutely, no problem at all. So if it's in your memory, then you can see it or feel it or somehow connect to it. In Tom's Park, all you have to do is think it. You know, it's the same thing. But if thinking it is hard there because it's not part of your experience, then use your experience to, to ground it. Absolutely. There is so much potential to Tom's Park. With my intellect at work, is it best to do things or try to just experience? I think you should just do what you feel like doing. Don't force yourself to do other things. Now, after you've been there 
20, 30 times and it gets to be old hat, then you can maybe say, well, I need some different things. So I'm going to learn the horseback riding. And then maybe you want to do that, but you're just kind of getting your bearings now. You're just getting your feet down. You're starting to build confidence in the process. So in that confidence building phase, which is almost everybody's beginning phase, just do what you want to do, play, uh, have fun, do your tasks or whatever you, you want. And as you have the inclination, start doing other things as well. And if horseback riding is a, is a kind of an interest or you think that might be fun, then, you know, you, one of the first things you might want to do is just go to the bar and talk to the horses, you know, and get to know them. And then maybe you could ride one, but maybe if horseback riding isn't your thing, you'll never do that because it's just not something you're interested in. You see, you don't have to do it all, but you should do what interests you. Let your own intuition tell you what it's good for you to work on because your own intuition is much wiser about what you should be doing and when you should be doing it than anything I could tell you. Tom, did you get any insights from your observations of us in the park? Well, I worked on all of the people who in their own minds feel like they were having trouble. And basically that was to relax, let go, just experience, you know, intellect, sit down and be quiet to, to help get the right attitude. So that was done en masse rather than for each individual. Each individual would feel it, each individual would get that, but I, I transmitted it all at once, more efficient that way. I think it's a good start. Yes, that's not where you want to end up you know, with that experience, but that's a good place to start. If you can do those things again, you may also want to walk out there again. Also get to that lemon tree, peel it again, except this time, hold it up, smell it, think, remember, what does a lemon smell like? You know, touch your tongue to it. What does a lemon taste like? Pull those things out of your memory. And then think about them and linger on them for a while until you get that smell and that taste. So you're doing, you're doing fine. That was good. Now you just have to keep doing it and repeating it and iterate on that and make it a little better each time, a little more detail. And eventually you're going to get to the point that you're so familiar with that, that everything just flows and is easy and you're not pushing it. Right now you're pushing it a bit. You know, you can feel like you're, you're kind of pushing this process along. That's okay in the beginning, but the more you do it, the more organic it will get. Would honing our sensory experiences here help to engage those same sensory experiences in Tom's Park? If you are more aware of your sensory data here, It'll be easier to be more aware of your sensory data there. And as you become more aware of your sensory data there, because you're actually trying to become aware of it, you become more aware of your sensory data here. You know, the Tom's Park isn't just going to be an experience inside Tom's Park. It's going to change who you are and your experience inside this physical reality. It's, there's, you know, there's going to be feedback. Who you are is going to affect how you interact in park, and the things you do in the park are going to affect how you interact here. There's two different realities that you're making choices in, and they affect each other. Can you use the park to resolve childhood trauma, such as witnessing an altercation between two very loved family members at a young age, and other things such as that? You could now have, an, have the experience of sitting down them as an adult, you know, and, and talking with them adult to adult about that and, and what it did and how you saw it and, and how it's affected your life. And in that process of that conversation, you may learn some things about them, about you, and about why it's still an issue after you thought it was long gone and, and accepted and over with. Hmm. So just exploring that would be 
a good way. And you can use the park as a kind of a base for that exploration. It just gives you a, see, once you go to the park, you already have put yourself into an intuitive space. When you're in the park, you're in an intuitive space. Once you're in that intuitive space, you can pretty much do what you want with your intent. And it, you know things should work pretty well for you there. You could go back to that in the, uh, in the room that takes you back in the past or in the uh, travel agency, it lets you go back to the past. And you could actually see what, what led up to that altercation. How is it that they ended up in that uh, quarrel? You know, what was leading to it? Not just the subject they were talking about, but all the other things, emotional and, and whatever, well, that led up to that. That might be interesting to see that it wasn't just a, a one-off, you know, quarrel. It, it had a lot, you know, led up to that. And understanding that might help some too. For those who don't want to interact, or have conversations, is it okay to just feel the experience? When you don't converse, then everything's simple. Everything's straightforward. It's all in a feeling space, and it's all completely honest. And if you have talk, then you're not so sure about that. You know, So don't talk. How can we remember the experiences in Tom's Park? One way that I suggest you try to bring those things to the surface that are now too foggy, you know, too much uh, out of sight, is to split yourself in two. And one of you is the person that is sleepy and is having the experience mostly in the subconscious realm. And the other of you has the not first person, but has the you know second person. You know, you're you're the observer, and you get to follow along, and you stay wide awake. But now you can't speak, and you can't intervene, and you can't interrupt. You can just observe. So you can be both of those people. So you can take a little piece of yourself, and let that be the observer, to watch. And that observer can, can see everything in your mind, every experience, everything you hear, every sight, every smell, everything. They will, they will be aware of that. So that's one way you can, you can work that problem. So it'll take a little practice to get used to it. It's a little different perspective, so it'll take a little while to get used to it. But after the fifth or sixth or tenth try, you see it should work very well. And part of you will go into that kind of sleepy, hypnagogic space. And the other will pay attention to what you see, hear, feel, think while you're there. Does the rule set allow day and night and weather changes? What would be against the rule set? Yes, it allows for both day and night. You know, there are some night activities there. If you remember down at the uh, recreation center where most of the staff, particularly younger staff, have their quarters, every uh, Saturday night, I think, the musicians among them get together and there's, there's dances down there in the evening go from, I don't remember exactly, I think it's like 8 o'clock to midnight or something. Uh, so there is night activity there. The weather is exactly the way you want it. In general, the park is a spring summer place. There's not ski slopes or ice skating on the lake. Now it could be a winter place, but it's a, it's a spring summer kind of a place. So it's got that sort of weather theme to it. Now it can have rainstorms, but it won't have any weather that is, can I say, dangerous, risky. It's not going to have a tornado that's going to tear the lodge up. It's not, those sorts of things will not happen there. But yes, it can rain. And if what you need to experience is that it rains all day while you're there, 
it just rains all day because you want to be in the movie theater in someplace else and uh, it just rains all day, then fine, it can rain all day while you're there. You see, but it's not going to turn into a hurricane and blow everything down and, and uh, create a problem. That won't happen there. But almost anything else can. You can have thunderstorms and lightning and hail and all sorts of things, but they're benign. You're not going to get hurt, nor will anybody else. So it's, it's kind of whatever you want. The weather is pretty much perfect for you. So however it suits you, that's the way it'll be. Now, if you walk up to a cliff and you're out in the woods, you're hiking, you're up in the mountains and you come to this cliff and it's a sheer cliff. If you decide to jump off of it, you'll just float slowly to the bottom and land and you won't be hurt. You can't get hurt in this park. <laughs> There's nothing you can do that's going to end up uh, being a negative or being a problem. No wild animals, no, no poison plants that are going to get you, you know, there's nothing there. So you can be in this place with complete confidence that you're okay. So you can't, you can't jump off a cliff and, and splat, you know, that the rules won't allow that. You just kind of float to the bottom. Then you'd have to climb back up again or find another way home. Is there enough space in Tom's Park? You can make it just as big as you want it. You just stretch it right out. You know, that's one of the rules is that you'll never get to anything there that's too busy or too crowded or the people involved are not available. That doesn't happen there. So it, uh, if you go to some thing, the movie theater will never be too crowded. You know, all the rooms and the hexagon rooms will never, won't not be full. It's just the nature of the place that it'll always be available. There'll always be enough room for you. Just walk right up to it and you will find a spot. Even if that means that a hundred people are inside a, you know, a three foot diameter tube, but that's all right. You'll find a spot and there'll be plenty of room. How can I distinguish my fear from my intuition? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. There's no way that you can say, oh, that's my, you know, that's my imagination. This is, you know, this is real. You know, this is the system's giving me this. There's no way you can tell where that information is coming from. There's never a tag on the source of the information. But what you do is you deal with that information in the most positive way you can. So if it's information that's not helpful, like you're not ready for this. You need to go do some other things first before you're ready. That, that kind of doubting, insecure kind of stuff. Then the right thing for you to do is say, I'm doing it anyway. Ready or not, here I come. So you have to accept that information, deal with it, and go on. So if it's negative and it's getting in the way, you just, like you say, you push it aside. You say, yeah, well, might, might be true. I might not be ready for this, but... I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to learn on the job. And that's how I'm going to approach it. So the, the worst thing that you would do would be to feed it. Oh, I'm not ready. Oh, why is that? Why am I not ready? Because then it would read off a whole lot of things. Well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. You can't do this other thing. And, you know, it, and then it would just, it would get worse. So the best is not to feed it, just to deal with it in a positive way. And you may sometimes agree with it. Sometimes that voice might say, you know, you should, you should be careful here. You're, you, uh, you know, don't, don't go that direction. And you may think about it and say, eh, that's silly. I need to go that direction. I'm going to go anyway. All right. I'll be careful. I'll be watchful and I'll be aware for issues. Thank you. And then you go anyway, or you might say, all right, you know, I really don't have to go that direction. So if your advice is not to, I'll agree with you. I'll go some other way. So you see, you get it, then you deal with it, whatever that way is that you deal with it, you deal with it and go on. And then you learn. So if you, if you're the one that says, well, I'm going to go this way anyhow, I don't care what you think. And then something unfortunate happens. Well, you learn something. 
maybe you should have paid attention. Maybe that voice was on your side, you see. But if you nothing happens that's, that's not good, then you can say, well, that voice doesn't always tell the truth. That voice doesn't know a whole lot. That voice is just out there trying to get my goat. Uh, and then you, you treat it that way. So if that voice wants you to pay attention to it, then it has to be nice and it has to be accurate and it can't give you false information. Otherwise, you'll learn to ignore it. So then you've just given notice to whomever and whatever created that voice that if you want my attention, then you have to work with me. Here are Tom's closing remarks and more advice for experiencing the park more fully. This has been very good. It's been a really good group and the questions have been good. I was very curious about what kind of questions I would get. You know, there's kind of a new idea. I don't know of anything else out in the world that's like this. It's kind of a, a new idea to delve into your imagination like this and make connections to a larger reality in the process. So I was, I was wondering what might happen here. And I see that all the questions have been really good. These are, this is the very reason this group was, or this course was put together for these, these things. And I hope, and I expect you learned a lot from each other. Uh, I, th I think a lot of the answers that I gave you know, individuals applied to a lot more than just them. So hopefully you did learn a lot from all the other questions. And I'm not sure what Keith has planned to do with this, but hopefully this will be uh, uh, put out and made available to, to people so that other people who are just beginners in Tom's Park will be able to learn from the questions that you have asked. So I appreciate your coming. I appreciate you being part of this. I appreciate you sharing with me your experiences in the park and particularly the problems and issues that you have. I too see the park as something that contains a, a vast potential, but it's something that if you want to gain that potential, you're going to have to work for it. It's not something that you, that you get and it just magically things happen. It's a tool for you to use to develop yourself. And there are not a lot of intuitive development tools out there. None of them that I know of that work like this. There's a few out there for developing intuition, but typically it's on a, a very different level than this. But I encourage you to just keep trying, be an experimentalist, just cut and try. If something isn't working, try something else. Use your imagination. Create the possibilities that you need. Bring them into the park with you. Try things out. Learn from them. See how they work. If that didn't work so well, then shift it and do it again, but do it a little differently. If that doesn't work, then shift it and do it again. Nobody answers your question, well, ask it in a different way. Pose it in a different form. Just keep working. The worst thing is that you decide that it's too much trouble and you just don't want to bother because then you won't learn from it. But if you continually, or I could say regularly visit Tom's Park, in the beginning, I suspect play is probably the most natural thing. As you get, if, as you get tired of the play, then being a little more serious in what you're doing and how you're going to do it and your growth and how that's taking place and information you'd like to find, then you can start working on that. But you approach it in the same, in the same way. So Tom's Park is a meditation. It's, it's a tool for getting into point consciousness where you're, all your sense data is, is no longer being processed. You don't really have to meditate or do anything. So it's just available to anybody off the street wants to start with it. Then there's no, there's no uh, prerequisite for it. You don't have to learn to meditate first. All you have to do is have an imagination. And most everybody has an imagination, even if you can't see things. You still have an imagination. You still have memory. And you can still replay those memories and then expand them and then make them change and add to them, extend them. And doing that, making those memories 
grow and extend, that's exercising your intuitive side. As soon as you get to the point where it takes on a life of its own, you stop intellectually pushing it, you just let it unfold. Then you're out of the intellect and into the intuitive side as it works on its own. So these are exercises. And just like any muscle, you know, you don't start off the first day lifting 200 pounds. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You'll hurt yourself. You start off the first day just lifting your own body weight, you know, your arms up in the air before you put weights on your arms. You know, you just do arms first. Well, that's the way this is. You're going to have to work at it, work at things that work for you. If it seems to get too complicated or there's too many people in the hot spring, well, then you'll need to say, well, let me close my eyes a minute. And when I open them, there'll be plenty of room for me. Oh, magic happens. And there's plenty of room for you now. Good. You can just go on in. If you want them to be plenty of people there because you're feeling very social, then just go on in and join the crowd and be social. The place is designed for you. And you custom make it. You custom derive it with your own intention. So this Tom's Park starts out as Tom's Park. It's going to end up as your own private, your own individual space, your own virtual reality that's handcrafted for you to help you get to where you want to be. If what you need to do is relax or what you need to do is get rid of insecurities, well, that's a place to do it. You set up situations where you can do that and then you do it. And at first you won't be good at it. So you practice it and practice it. And pretty soon you'll be good at it. And the amazing thing is that when you get good at it in Tom's Park, you'll start to get better at it in this reality too. It transfers over. So anything that might be hard to do in this reality, like even relationship, if you have a real hard time with relationship in this reality, start with relationship in that reality. You see, that's a, that's a safe space for you to try new things, to try being authentic and being yourself, to reach out and kind of go beyond what is comfortable for you. You can do that there because it's safe. It's entirely safe. It's entirely positive. It's entirely helpful, entirely supportive. And then once you've done it, a hundred times, and it's kind of easy and second nature, you'll see that you'll be doing it here too, in this reality. So all the issues you think you might have, or the problems, or things you need help in, this is the place that can be your special place where you can work these things out in a safe, supportive environment, and find that, that uh, the problems are solving themselves in this physical reality as well. So this, this idea that our imagination, oh, it's just your imagination. You know, your imagination is like a throwaway thing. It's the junk in your mind. You know, imagination isn't significant. Well, that's because people don't understand it. It's your consciousness. And consciousness is creative. And it can create virtual realities. And it can learn and make choices and do things in those virtual realities. And by the doing and the choice making, it evolves and grows and becomes something more. So I encourage you to make this Tom's Park your Tom's Park, not just the way I've written it, but your Tom's Park. Keep it safe, keep it positive. And as I say in the notes, if there's anything in there that's negative, it's because you bring it in. It's that negativity you bring with you. So if you run into things negative, right away that tells you, you brought them there. Now you need to deal with them. So use it as a, as a space to, to grow up in, a safe space to grow up in. That's kind of what I intended for it to be. So it does have a huge potential for all sorts of things. This, you know, you could take a Tom's part for, you know, for corporations, you know, where people would learn not only how to get along with each other better, but how to solve problems and use their creativity to solve 
you know, corporate issues, or you could make it for athletes who want to get better at their sport. Or you could turn this into all sorts of things. It's harnessing the power of consciousness to change itself in a positive, um, you know, safe, supportive way. So that's really what Tom's Park is.